This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hi, folks. Before we start the show, I want to ask for your help. If you enjoy Kick-Ass Politics, I hope you'll help us reach our goal of raising our full production budget for 2016 by donating on our website at kickasspolitics.com or at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Thanks for listening, and now enjoy the show. Greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And remember, my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. You that was the amazing Criswell, the famously bad psychic, known for his wildly inaccurate prognostications that, among other things, predicted that in 1989, Denver, Colorado would be struck by a ray from outer space that would cause all metal to adopt the properties of rubber, leading to mass casualties in amusement parks when carousels and roller coasters melt, sending passengers hurtling to their doom. He also divined that an outburst of mass cannibalism would terrorize the people of Pennsylvania in the year 1980, and the very first interplanetary convention would be held in Las Vegas in 1990, with citizens from Mars, Venus, Neptune, and the Moon in full representation. He said humans will go extinct in 1990, when we all suffocate to death due to a mysterious black rainbow that draws all of the oxygen from our atmosphere. Oh, and the U.S. Capitol? It's going to relocate from Washington to Wichita, Kansas. But he was right about one thing. We are all interested in the future. And today, in part two of my interview with theoretical physicist and futurist Dr. Michio Kaku, we'll focus on the near future and the real innovations in science and technology that will radically change every aspect of our daily lives within the next 50 years. And very few people know what the future holds better than Dr. Michio Kaku, who spends much of his time lecturing and writing on the future of science. He's the author of eight books and three New York Times bestsellers, including Physics of the Impossible, a scientific exploration into the world of phasers, force fields, teleportation, and time travel. Physics of the Future, how science will shape human destiny and our daily lives by the year 2100, and his most recent book, The Future of the Mind, The Scientific Quest to Understand, Enhance, and Empower the Mind. He's appeared on hundreds of television programs, and he's a science contributor on CBS This Morning. He's also hosted several television series and specials of his own, including a three-hour special for the Discovery Channel called 2057, in which he explored the next 50 years of innovation, as well as a three-hour documentary for BBC TV called Visions of the Future, and two seasons of his popular television series for the Science Channel called Sci-Fi Science, Physics of the Impossible. Today he'll talk about the incredible advances in science and technology that will take place in many of our lifetimes, radically changing every aspect of our daily lives. And in some cases, these inventions are already being tested right now and may be widely available within just the next five to ten years. He'll talk about remarkable medical advances such as growing actual human organs to replace failed livers and hearts, a microchip in your toilet that will detect cancer cells 10 years before they can grow into a tumor, a personal MRI machine that fits into the palm of your hand, and a radical new approach to aging that could add decades to our lives and perhaps even stop aging and death altogether. He'll talk about mechanical exoskeletons that will soon allow wounded warriors to fully recover their mobility and soldiers in our military to have superhuman strength, and modular robots that can reform into any shape and go anywhere, computers that will fit into a contact lens, and brain technology for recording motion pictures of our dreams as we sleep, mentally controlling objects in a form of modern-day telekinesis, 
uploading whole college courses directly into our minds and perhaps even downloading our entire consciousness to a computer so our great-great-grandchildren can one day hold a real conversation with us long after we're gone, plus many other extraordinary things in store for us in just the next few years. Today's episode will absolutely astound you with my guest, theoretical physicist, Dr. Michio Kaku, coming up in just a moment. to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. My guest today is theoretical physicist, Professor Michio Kaku. He's also the author of three New York Times bestsellers. He's an acclaimed public speaker, renowned futurist, and popularizer of science. Professor Michio Kaku, thank you for sitting down to talk to me. Glad to be on your show. I want to talk about perhaps things that are a little bit more relevant to us, the living right now in the here and now, Um, stuff that may be possible within the next few decades. You say there are three words that will disappear from our language in the next few decades, computers, traffic accidents, and tumors. Yeah, first of all, people live in horror of tumors because once a tumor is diagnosed as being cancerous, your life goes downhill very, very fast. However, in the future, we're going to have something called DNA chips inside your toilet. Your toilet will be intelligent. It'll pick up enzymes from cancer genes, cancer cells, cancer colonies, maybe, just maybe 10 years before a tumor forms. By the time you have a tumor, you have over 10 billion or so cancer cells festering inside your body. And it's been festering there for years and years. Why not nip it in the bud? When it's a hundred, a hundred cancerous cells in a colony years before the first symptoms arise. Now we have these chips already. This is not science fiction. They're called wow. DNA chips and uh, liquid biopsies. That's the first impact that's going to be affecting millions of Americans in the next few years. Watch for it. Ask your doctor for liquid biopsies. That is your bodily fluids that are then analyzed using these chips that can detect cancer cells, cancer enzymes, cancer genes. They're so good, for example, that one DNA chip can detect one cancer blood cell out of a billion, I repeat that, out of a billion blood cells, it'll detect one cancer (laughs) blood cell. Wow, that's incredible. That's how accurate these are. And this is a merger of computer technology with biotechnology. And so we're seeing Moore's Law, the fact that computer power doubles every 18 months, having a direct impact on cancer diagnosis. And that's why I say that the word tumor will disappear from the English language. So we would get cancer, but no one would ever die of it because we would catch it so far in advance that it would never... That's right. My personal point of view is that we'll always have cancer because, of course, there are 200 tissues of the body and there are millions of ways you can mutate these 200 tissues. But it'll be like the common cold. We live with a common cold, right? In the future, people will say, oh, I have cancer. Oh, what else is new, right? Because you'll catch (laughs) it real early. And just like the common cold is never going to get out of hand, never going to turn into pneumonia. And cancer will not become murderous because we'll be able to catch it when it's still at the phase of a colony rather than a tumor. And that's why I say tumor, the word tumor, will disappear from the English language. That's incredible. Now, you also talk about we'll be able to, uh, I guess we would be able to have organs that we grow in a Petri dish, so to speak. That's right. From your own cells. You need a new liver. That's right. From your own cells. Today, not tomorrow. Today, Today. we can grow skin, bone, cartilage, noses, ears, bladders, complete windpipes, heart tissue, (laughs) blood vessels. That's today, not tomorrow. Wow. Tomorrow, it'll be more complex organs like the liver, the kidney, the pancreas. And this means that many of the afflictions that we read about in the newspapers, right? Kidney failure, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, and pancreatic cancer. 
and diabetes will be able to cure by simply growing new organs of the body. For the Science Channel, I took a film crew down to Wake Forest University, and we filmed this. We filmed <laughs> doctors creating new organs of the body, and I felt like Dr. Frankenstein in Frankenstein's <laughs> laboratory. There were all these bell jars containing human organs. Oh, wow. Except they were grown in the laboratory. And so, again, the prototypes of livers and the pancreas, they're not commercially available. They're still experimental. But simpler organs like bladders, like windpipes, um, like heart tissue, we've already done that now in the laboratory. Wow. So you would never need a donor again. In principle, right. In fact, so many thousands of people die waiting for a kidney yeah. that never arrives. And take a look at Mickey Mantle, the great Yankee baseball uh, star. Uh, he had cirrhosis of the liver. He was a hard-drinking man, destroyed his liver, and created a national controversy. Who gets the liver, the famous and the rich, or, or somebody who's been waiting in line for years? So, okay, so we can basically do whatever we want to our bodies then. Well, <laughs> then we can I would not drink abuse. and be crazy, do drugs, whatever. No, I, I would not abuse it because oh, okay. uh, we have not been able to grow the first lung yet. Mm. And lung cancer, of course, is a byproduct of, uh, of heavy cigarette smoking. Yeah. So I would not advise abusing your liver or your lungs. Okay. Well, you also say along those lines that we're pretty close to figuring out how to stop or dramatically slow down aging. Uh, What's the science behind that? Well, let me be blunt. We do not have the fountain of youth yet. We do <laughs> not have the fountain of youth. However, once we say that, we are making incredible inroads into teasing apart the genetics and the mechanism of aging itself. What is aging? We didn't even know what aging was 10 years ago, but now we know what it is. It is the buildup of error. Hmm. That's what aging is. The buildup of genetic error, cellular error, errors in the functioning of a cell. But take a look at a car, for example. Where does air build up in a car? Well, the engine, of course, right? Yeah. When the engine goes, the car goes, right? That's where you have the wear and tear, the engine. That's where combustion takes place. So that's where you get carbon deposits. But you see the engine of the cell. What is the engine of the cell? It is the mitochondria. It is the engine where you get ATP, energy, coming from the cell. That's where aging takes place for the most part in a cell. We can actually see that. When we genetically sequence the genes of old people, compare it with the genes of young people, and math mathematically see where the damage takes place, it takes place mainly in the mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria has cell repair mechanisms, but they also begin to wear down with time. So one day in the future, we'll be able to crank up the cell repair mechanisms, which already exist, and repair the damage to the mitochondria and extend the lifespan. Of course, it'll be a combination of many therapies. Another therapy that's being looked at is caloric restriction. If I take an animal, any animal, from yeast, uh, from bugs to mice, cats, dogs, and now primates, and give them 30% less calories, they live 30% longer. You really? take any animal on the planet Earth except one, any animal on the planet Earth except one, you feed them 30% less, they live 30% longer. Wow. The one species okay. which has not been subjected to this reproducible experiment is Homo sapiens, because we complain too much. Can you imagine <laughs> eating 30% less? You'd yeah. sue. You'd sue these people, right? Well, We're too it, cranky. And, it makes sense. And we bellyache too much. Yeah, but it makes sense because, you know, if you lose weight, if you don't eat a bunch of fatty stuff and you exercise, well, this wouldn't be exercising. This would just, just be restricting your calories. You don't have all that extra weight. The downside is if you analyze these animals who live longer, yeah, they're miserable. they also are <laughs> lethargic, slow, and huh. they lose all interest in sex. Interesting. Can you imagine like humans being subjected to that kind of <laughs> regimen? You have a revolution on your hands, Yeah, <laughs> even though they live longer. Well, you know, the other thing that you say is computers, that's a word that we won't even use pretty soon because it'll just be part of our life, like electricity or running water. Right. What's in store for us with computers that we won't mention in the future? Yes, what happens is that computer chips will cost a penny, and that's the cost of scrap paper. Bubblegum <laughs> wrappers yeah. will cost more than computers. And as a consequence, computers will be everywhere and nowhere, like electricity. 
Electricity is under your feet, in the walls, in the ceiling. You don't even think about it. Electricity is everywhere, and yet it's invisible. That's the future of computer technology, to disappear from the fabric of life. The internet, too. So the internet, for example, will be in your contact lens. So when I look at you and I blink, I see your biography next to your image. And when you talk to me in Chinese, I'll see subtitles of Chinese translated into English. And when I go outside, I blink. I have a description of anything that I'm not familiar with. I'll know who I'm talking to, what I'm talking about. Uh, driving is going to become uh, very, luxur uh, very pleasant because I'll know exactly where I'm going, what I'm doing, what I'm looking at. <laughs> and this is just going to be part of life. When you buy something, you'll simply look at it, blink, and you bought it. Yeah, and it'll be a boon to students cheating on tests. Yeah, this is going to revolutionize education because education is 90% memorization of stupid things you're going to forget anyway after the final <laughs> exam. In the future, you'll have to learn concepts and principles because the periodic chart is there by blinking. All the answers to the parts of a flower, all the answers to the stupid questions you're going to forget anyway are there by blinking. Education is going to be turned upside down when information is free and available and everywhere, we're going to have to stress concepts, principles, rather than simply memorizing the periodic chart of elements. Which is probably better in general anyways. That's right. You know, when I was, a, uh, when I was young, uh, everyone had a slide roll, a slide roll on their hip. They were boasting, oh, I'm a future engineer, I'm a future scientist, I have a slide roll. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, this is kind of stupid. <laughs> a slide roll is a tool. That's all it is. Science is not about using tools so much. It's about understanding concepts and principles that make the world move. For example, learning biology. It's not learning the parts of a flower. It's learning evolution. It's how flowers evolve, how colors and shapes and forms are governed by survival of the fittest. That's biology. Yeah, and it, it, I'm fascinated by this idea of a contact lens. I think somewhere you said that even dating would be different because instead of Match.com or Tinder or whatever, we would be walking around with people's information archive, pass a pretty girl, it would say whether she's available tonight. And all that. She That's would, right. They would put them, make themselves available online. Right. And In we fact, could there's see even a company I saw that has adopted that with Google Glasses, that when you walk down the street, you can make contact with other people who also have Google Glasses who are also subscribing <laughs> to this same dating service. And so dating will simply be going outside and just making contact with people because your contact lens is attuned wow. to other people's contact lenses, and you'll immediately know whether there's an attraction or not. That's unbelievable. Now, the blinking technology, how would, I mean, how do you keep from accidentally you know, <laughs> okay. clicking on the wrong thing? Or... First of all, you're gonna have to have a controller in your hand, okay? Oh, okay. And so, basically, the contact lens in your, your eye is a screen. Just okay. think of it as a computer screen. Okay. Right. And you still have to have your fingers. Uh, eventually, you'll do it I mentally because you'll mentally control it with a oh. chip in your brain. You'll mentally control the contact lens in your eye. But for the short term, you'll have a handheld device by which you can type, you can move the cursor inside your contact lens, and that's how you can control it. Eventually, we'll do it mentally because already we can take people who are totally paralyzed and give them the gift of mobility. When you saw the soccer games in Sao Paulo, Brazil, mm -hmm. the opening shot was a totally paralyzed person who had a chip in his brain inserted at Duke University, and he kicked the football with an exoskeleton straight out of Iron Man comics. <laughs> this is today, not, to, not tomorrow. We already have Iron Man exoskeletons, complements of the United States military, right, yeah. which has dumped over $150 million so that our wounded warriors from Iraq and Afghanistan can have the gift of mobility, even with a paralyzing spinal cord injury. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, such an amazing thing for our veterans who've been injured overseas. But could it also make us superhuman? Or, I mean, were we talking about making superhuman cyborg warriors, perhaps? Well, first of all, the United States Pentagon understands that memory is affected by brain injuries. They've mm -hmm. awarded a $50 million contract for a memory chip. Already mm -hmm. now in animals, we can record memories. This is straight out of the matrix. Uh, we're talking about recording simple memories in mice, uploading those memories once those memories are forgotten. At MIT, they even uploaded the first false memory into a mouse. Oh, Next wow. will be primates. We'll be able to load memories into monkeys. 
After that, we're going to create a brain chip for Alzheimer's patients. We're going to have millions of Alzheimer's people perhaps wandering the streets, not knowing who they are, creating havoc. It's already happening in Japan, for example. Mm. So in the future, they'll have a memory chip. You push the memory chip. It's a pacemaker. And the brain pacemaker energizes your hippocampus, and you know who you are, where you live, and who your relatives are. But if you have Alzheimer's, how do you remember that you have the chip? Well, if you're too far <laughs> gone, sorry about that. I oh, mean, okay. there's only so far you can okay. go. Would this get to the point where we could take a whole college course well, by just implanting a chip or what? We are not there yet. I repeat, we are definitely okay. not there yet. However, it is conceivable that one day you'll be able to enjoy a vacation that you never had. In other words, somebody else will record the memory of him surfing and sunning himself on the beach and having a great time. Those memories will be recorded and be commercially available so that you can push a button and then imagine yourself surfing, imagine yourself sunning yourself in Hawaii <laughs> and things like that. Now, we're not there yet, but there's no law of physics or biology that prevents us from contemplating this because we already now can record simple memories in mice. Well, if we can upload information and insert information to our brain, can we also eventually perhaps download it? Uh, it's possible. Um, for example, false memories can be uploaded and downloaded, uh, and that re raises ethical questions as well. Let's say a criminal gets access to this technology and records the memory of firing a gun and then implants it into an unsuspecting innocent bystander who now has a memory of him firing the lethal weapon that killed somebody. So, yeah, there are going to be ethical implications of this as we begin to record, uh, record, download, and upload memories, both false and true. Um, essentially, then, I guess you've said that we could uh, download our consciousness to a disk, and in theory, we could exist forever. Yeah, this Even after is, we're dead. Yeah, this is something that people have talked about who work on the Connectome project. The Connectome project has been funded to a billion dollars this year by the European Union and by Barack Obama. And we want to basically have a complete map of the entire brain, a complete map. And that map, of course, would contain our memories, our sensations, our emotions, basically the essence of our soul contained inside a, a disk. And then we can create a library, a library of souls. So instead of going to the library to read about Winston Churchill, why not go to the library and talk to him? Why wow. not have a library which has all the information of what he looked like, how his body moved, his favorite expressions, his memories, so you could go to the library and chat with him? In fact, I wouldn't mind talking to Albert Einstein. I wouldn't <laughs> mind talking to a computer program that analyzes all his thought patterns and understands how he was led to his great theories. And maybe you will be able to have a conversation with your great, 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 great granddaughter years after you're dead and have a conversation with your descendants because all your memory circuits are preserved inside a computer. That's incredible. So it wouldn't just necessarily be data, memories, but would it act? could you actually have that person, in other words, their personality and If you have the right. memory circuits of the human brain in principle, the memory circuits would react to any kind of stimulus. So if you were to tell a joke, the connectome would then re either laugh or not laugh, <laughs> just like you would either laugh or not laugh upon hearing that very same joke. Now again, we are decades away from doing this. I don't want to get people to think that we're going to do this anytime soon. But I think by the end of the century, it is conceivable that we will have the connectome, we will have the essence of our humanity on a disc, and you will live forever. Well, we'll take a quick break, and then I'll be back with more with Dr. Michio Kaku, back in just a moment. If you're enjoying my conversation with Professor Michio Kaku, then you'll love his books, Physics of the Future and the Future of the Mind. And right now, you can download the audio version of those books for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download, which can be Physics of the Future, The Future of the Mind, or a number of other books by my guest today, Dr. Michio Kaku, plus any of Audible's 180,000 titles. 
That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. We're back, and I'm talking with Professor Michio Kaku. Um, I feel like artificial intelligence and robots in the 80s, you know, that everyone was talking about, you know, we were going to have this Jetsons-like lifestyle with a robot butler and everything, and then it kind of went dark. And in the past five years, every day, it seems that there's some kind of new headline about artificial intelligence and robots. And when you watch the media, it sounds like it's so much closer than we really are. You say that we're really not that close to being able to have robot butlers. Yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, because of Moore's Law, we are galloping ahead. A new breakthrough is being made just last week. Uh, Google's DeepMind was able to beat a world champion in the Asian game of Go, which is much more complicated than chess. So we can now create robots that can beat any human in any of the classical games. However, you cannot go to DeepMind, slap it on its back, and say, congratulations, you just won this tremendously historic debate. In fact, the computer has no self-awareness. It doesn't even know that it's a machine. It doesn't know that it won a game. It doesn't even know what a game is. It's an adding machine, a very sophisticated adding machine that can actually learn Ones a little bit. Zeros. But we forget the fact it's an adding machine. Now, do you go to your calculator and have a nervous breakdown saying, oh, my God, you can calculate faster than me. I'm obsolete. <laughs> your, my calculator that I held in my, hold in my hand is much better at adding than me. Well, of course you don't, because that's all it can do. It's a one-trick pony. It can add. Now, that doesn't mean that in the future we might not have robots as smart as us. I'm just saying that we are many, many decades away from that. Our most advanced robot is called Asimo, built in Japan by the Honda Corporation. It can run, walk, climb upstairs, dance. It even dances much better than me. <laughs> I've been on with Asimo several times. But I interviewed the inventor of Asimo, and I asked him how smart is the world's smartest robot. And he was very honest. He said that his creation, the smartest robot on Earth, has the intelligence of an insect, even a bug can manipulate, run around, jump, hide, find maids, find food right. much more efficiently than Asimo, which can basically run, walk, jump. Now, this has practical implications for the Fukushima disaster in Japan. Hmm. The United States military sponsors challenges. They created the Internet. It was not Al Gore. The Internet was created by the United States Pentagon in the form of DARPAnet. Next, they want to create a robot challenge that can clean up the Fukushima disaster. It's the ideal place to yeah. showcase artificial intelligence. Think of that. Billions of people would applaud the makers of robots if we could clean up the mess at Fukushima. The test was a robot has to drive a car, get out of the car, sweep the floor, turn a valve. Every entry pretty, pretty failed simple. except one. Go to the internet, look <laughs> up the DARPA challenge, and you'll wow. see these robots getting out of the car, falling over. One by one, they <laughs> fall over. They reach for the broom, they fall over. They reach for the, turn, the bow, they fall over. Now, again, I'm not saying that one day we won't have perfect robots. I'm just saying that we are many decades away from achieving the ability of a cockroach to maneuver in three dimensions. Um, I guess a few months ago, about a thousand scientists signed an open letter to the UN calling for a ban on autonomous weapons or so-called killer robots. Are you saying that we really don't need to be worrying about that yet? Well, yes and no. There is one type of killing machine that we have to worry about, but the Terminator robot that takes over the world and sets off a nuclear war, that is real science fiction for the next century. One okay. thing we do have to worry about is drones that have pattern recognition that can recognize the human form and shoot it, okay? Now already we have drones which are very close to that, but there's a human, a human override. So some teenager someplace has to push a button in order to actually fire the drone. But let's say there's a misfire. Let's say a circuit short circuits inside uh, the drone, and all of a sudden it simply fires away. Every time it identifies the human form, it fires. Yeah, that scary. could be a killing machine. Again, not like an atomic bomb or not like poison gas, but yeah, it could probably kill hundreds of people 
if you have a runaway drone that can simply recognize the human form and shoot regardless of who is pushing the button. So I think there should be controls. However, let's not panic because our robots are very primitive. As the former director of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory once said, the probability of a robot that can think walking out of the laboratory today is the same as the probability that a hurricane will create a B-47 jet liner from scratch. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is that you know, we're so stuck in this narrow idea of humanoid robots, robots that would look like us. But you've pointed out that the key to making robots really is going to be modularity. How does modularity change the game? Yeah, you see, we have this brainwashed thinking. Uh, every time we think of the robots taking over, we think of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator just killing people left and right. You realize that there are several defects in that scenario. Okay? First of all, we now realize that the brain of the robot does not necessarily have to be physically inside the robot. It could be in the cloud. So cloud computing is much more powerful than a single chip inside Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger's Terminator robot. And so that is a leap in terms of what we can do. And that's what Google's DeepMind did. It was not a chip versus a human being. It was the internet, where you have potentially thousands, millions of computers lashed together that energize the DeepMind. Plus, you can have modularity. That is, why do we have to have this all-purpose human-like humanoid doing all these things in a half-assed way? Why not have modules that can do things much better than humans and separate these functions? And so we have some modules that can do repair work, other modules which can uh, perform uh, household duties, other modules which can cook rather than having the all-purpose butler or the all-purpose maid. Wow. So, yeah, the modules, they would be autonomous and they can reform in all kinds of different shapes. Let me give an example. Depending on the circumstances. Let's say you're a construction worker for the utility and there's a pipe break or a short circuit way underneath the ground. What are you going to do? Rip up the entire street and create havoc? No, you're going to put down a snake. You can put a snake down there that's going to sliver, sliver its way, find the place where oh, the cool. thing took place, and then reform, dissolve into its components, reform into a spider so that it can do complex uh, manipulations of the broken pipe and so on and so forth. So and then it rearranges basically. itself like a transformer. Huh. So we think that a robot has to be humanoid with one shape. It could be shape-shifting. Robot. We, in fact, we already have robots at Carnegie Mellon uh, in Pittsburgh, which are shapeshifters. They actually can dissolve, reform into a different shape. In one shape, they're a spider. In another shape, they're a snake, for example. Aside from the unified field theory, on a daily basis, what do you spend the largest part of your time thinking about? Well, I do a lot of public speaking because I want to energize right. young people to be interested in science. However, that's not where I spend most of my time. Most of my time I spend thinking, thinking about the unified field theory, chasing after the equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. This is what I do for a living. And how do I do it? Think of a composer. A composer simply does not sit in a chair and crank out reams and reams of melodies. No, the composer stares out the window. He's already memorized all the notes. He knows the sharps and flats and chords. He plays with melodies. And then once in a while, some of these melodies begin to gel. Then he sits down in a chair and starts to write music, plunk a few notes on a piano, and then he goes out the window staring again. That's how we work. We basically stare out the window. I've memorized most of the equations of string theory. I stare out the window. I play with these equations until these equations start to move. And then life is breathed into these equations. Interesting. Well, you know, Einstein, his greatest breakthroughs came to him in the form of pictures, images in his mind, uh, the theory of relativity and so forth, were all kind of mental pictures in his thought experiments. Um, do you do that also? I try. Uh, one of my favorite Einstein quotes is that if a theory cannot be explained to a child, then the theory is probably useless. <laughs> Meaning that... Mediocre theories are nothing but just algebra, which doesn't mean anything. Great theories are based on simple pictures, 
pictures that a child can understand. Relativity, for example, is based on clocks, meter sticks, rocket ships. Newton's theory of gravity is based on balls going around other balls in orbits. And so the greatest theories of all time have been based on simple physical pictures. And string theory, of course, is based on music. That music yeah. is the main paradigm by which we can explain the complexity of the universe. You know, 2,000 years ago, we had the Pythagoreans who worked out the harmonics of a lyre string. And they thought that the universe could be explained by the mathematics of a lyre string. Well, that never went anywhere because, of course, the atomic theory is the theory that proved most efficient. However, now we can split atoms and we have hundreds of subatomic particles and we think that they are nothing but musical notes on a lyre string. So we're coming full huh. circle again. Well, Professor Michio Kaku, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about science and physics and things that are way above my pay grade, I think. Where can people follow you and keep uh, up with you? You can go to my website, um, mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org. We're up to 2.7 million people on Facebook and half a million right. people on Twitter. Wow. And you have a radio show, too. That's right. Science Fantastic. Uh, go to my website and you can see when and where, what call letters um, of the stations carry the show. 130 radio stations carry the show on weekends. Okay. Well, Dr. Michio Kaku, thank you so much. My pleasure. And if you enjoyed today's episode, I'd encourage you to read some of his fascinating books, especially Physics of the Impossible, Physics of the Future, and The Future of the Mind. It's really interesting stuff, and it covers a lot of what we talked about today. So I'll include Amazon links where you can order those or other books by Dr. Michio Kaku in the show notes for this episode and on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Or if you'd prefer to listen to the audio versions of his books, you can download those for free through a special trial offer just for our listeners at audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. You can follow Professor Michio Kaku at mkaku.org. That's M-K-A-K-U dot org. Or you can follow him on Twitter at at Michio Kaku. You can also subscribe to his weekly podcast on iTunes. It's called Explorations in Science. Or if you go to his site, you can find a list of stations that carry his weekly syndicated radio show, Science Fantastic. Now, don't forget to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review. That'll help a bunch with our podcast ratings. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the donate button on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Your support is very much appreciated. Follow us on Twitter at at KA Politics or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook. And while you're there, recommend Kickass Politics to your friends on your social media. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. In the next episode, I'll talk with Australian journalist Michael Ware. He's a former Baghdad bureau chief for Time magazine and war correspondent for CNN. In 2003, Michael Ware arrived in Baghdad as a novice reporter on a three-week assignment to cover the invasion of Iraq. He left seven years later, having gained unprecedented access to the Iraqi insurgency and American troops, and scarred by having seen the unimaginable brutality of the group that eventually became ISIS. Now his story is told in a new documentary for HBO called Only the Dead See the End of the War from two-time Oscar-winning director Bill Gutentag. Michael Ware will talk about the shocking violence of the Iraqi insurgency, the time he was kidnapped and nearly executed by agents of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, plus he'll talk about the front row seat he had for the birth of al-Qaeda in Iraq and its transformation into the modern-day terrorist nation-state called ISIS. Coming up with my guest, war correspondent Michael Ware, on the next podcast. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics.